Hello, all. We'll wait a few minutes while hopefully people come over from uh, Rico's. Four people in here. Oh, man, that's that's three more than I thought would come here. Hope you all are doing well. Good morning or afternoon, Bex from Bex Fish Room. Ian from Atkins. Good morning, Matt. What's up, Doc? What do you... Uh, um, you, you Bugs Bunny. Thank you all for showing up today. Thank you, Dr. Foreman. 3G, good, grand, and gracias for that 3G. Good morning, young man, Dragon Lair. Lurking and packing up fish, Maria Z. You packing up fish for me? Sending me some fish? Just so you know, you can see in the background, uh, that is a 500 gallon uh, corner tank that I built my, myself, probably around uh, 15 years ago. And what it is, it's uh, filled with about 25 wild caught, um, wild caught red spotted green discus from Peru. There's some Rominos tetras from Peru. There's some Polker tetras from Peru, bunch of corridors from Peru, um, just a bunch of stuff from Peru. Um, so as you can tell, I like discus. So we'll give people a little bit more time, a couple more minutes. We've only been streaming for less than two minutes. So um Give me people some time. So good morning, Paul. Let's see. I'll go. I'll go through the list. We'll we'll do that this morning. Good morning, Ian Bex, Matt from Liquid Zoo, ABC Aquatic Biotype. Good morning, Ben Beckstrom. Good morning or afternoon. It's morning still for me. My fish tanks aquatics. Good morning, uh, Greek geek boy who that was a boy, but when I saw his. Him on the stream the other night with Rico. He's not a young boy. Great, great plant. So uh, if I had tanks set up for plants, I would have loved to get those. Kelly Foreman, Maria Z, Finn Wiggles, uh, John's Vlog, Jennifer Weaver, Jimmy P's Aquarium, Master Aquatics, just Call me Eduardo, or we'll call him La Voz. Um, let's see. Cold Water Aquatics, Chris Hal, Paul Sotero. Um, S, Dr. Saab. Hmm, am I Dr. Saab? Or Saab? Paul McCarthy. Good evening out there in the UK. We have some uh, people that actually represent uh, us in the UK at the for Amazon Research Center. I believe it's OSA Aquatics, um, Tim Haywood, um, who does our stuff in, in the UK. See, Greek boy, cold water, Greek boy. So everybody's here who can be here. Um, so, you know, I want to make this a little educational. I want to make it a little fun. I want to make it uh, talking about fish. But good morning, Dee Dee. I had to say good, good morning, Dee Dee. Um, but you know, I, I'm a college professor. Just to give you an idea, some of you may not know me. I'm a, a university professor. Received my PhD in zoology. Been studying fish ecology uh, for. Whew, I've been a college professor for 31 years. Uh, and so this is something, you know, I've been doing, um, um, you know, it's hard. This is my first live, um, video cast and it's hard not to read the comments as they come in. Um, so please forgive me. Um, so, you know, I've studied fish all over the world. I started studying, uh, fish to begin with, uh, in the Red Sea working on uh, migration of coral reef fishes, then moved on to uh, mate acquisition in clownfish way before 
um, Nemo came out. Um, and once, this is while I was a professor in Texas, once we moved back to California, my wife and I, uh, I started to work in the Amazon, been working in the Amazon since about 2002, and started the research center about 2000 and, um, 2010 is when we bought the land for the research center. It's only been in the last couple of years, last five years that we've really been serious about the research center. Uh, in March, I will be going back to the research center and I'll be doing a live stream on March 21st, which is a Monday, uh, just walking around the research center so you can see um, what, what, what's going on. Yes, I'm going to need some mods. Um, you know, I'd like to, you know, if you're interested in being a mod, please get a hold of me. Uh, I just don't want to, you know, force anybody to be a mod. In other words, you have to be here all the time. I don't want that to happen. I want people, I want this to happen organically. Um, so let, let's talk about invasive species. I mean, because if we look at it, invasive species is something that um, has come to light lately with this uh, um, proposed legislation that's been, you know, trying to go through Congress or trying to go through the Senate right now. Uh, and the Lacey Act amendments were all about invasive species. So I, I thought that would uh, be a good place to start uh, because it's it's something that that supposedly the reason behind those um, amendments. And it's also something I've been working on in, in Peru for many years, looking at uh, grami, blue grami or two-spot grami, uh, guppies, and most recently tilapia in the area. So uh, this is something that I've been doing as for my science, but it's something that we all could be concerned with. Um, so I'm going to run it kind of like a lecture to begin with. I don't want I don't want this to be a lecture type thing, but uh, so let's talk about some of the um, characteristics that fish that tend to be invasive. What, what are those characteristics? So there are two terms that are going to be used interchangeably right now. Exotic species. Really, an exotic species is just a species that does not belong in an area. So it's a species that's found its way to a new environment. An invasive species is one in which has now taken hold in the environment and is starting to outcompete other species. You can be an exotic without being invasive. In other words, you can be in an environment without taking over the environment, just be in very low numbers. And it's only about mm, somewhere less than 10% of all the exotics actually become invasive. And we always hear about those invasive. We don't necessarily hear about the exotics because they're not causing a problem. So some of the characteristics that all invasives share in common is one thing is is that they tend to have a generalized diet. Now, that can be misleading because if we look at tilapia, so we have millions of tilapia here in Southern California that were brought over to begin with to get rid of another exotic uh, that we had in the irrigation canals in the Imperial Valley and the Yuma area of Arizona where I grew up. I grew up in the Imperial Valley, not Yuma. Um, and they brought over tilapia because the tilapia they brought over were herbivorous in their native environments. Well, they brought them over to California and instead of eating all the plants, instead of eating the hydrilla that um, were in the environment, they consumed the fish. And one of the areas that they became really infested in is the area around the Salton Sea. Salton Sea is the largest um, saltwater body, inland saltwater body here in California. It, it was a mistake that happened when the Colorado River overflowed its banks in the early 1900s. The surrounding streams and creeks that flowed into the Salton Sink at the time were filled with uh, desert pupfish. Well, once a tilapia got a foothold in the Salton Sea, which is much saltier than the ocean, but 
tilapia can withstand a lot of different environments. They proceeded to consume the desert pupfish. Now, that was not the only reason why the desert pupfish kind of died away. Habitat destruction uh, was massive in that area. So the combination of the tilapia and the, and the habitat destruction led to the downfall of the desert pupfish. So they only ate plants in the native environments, but when they brought into a new environment that all those food niches are available to them. So they tend to have a wide open food requirements once they get into their native environments. Um, they also tend to like areas of disturbance. So if, if they're found in a pristine habitat, a lot of times they cannot compete with a native species. But once there's disturbances that occur in that environment, because they have um, high environmental tolerances, they can start out competing. In Peru, where I work with Grammys, uh, the Grammys are found in the open sewage canals where they multiply by the billions. And we're talking billions with a B. And once they get into the main stem of the rivers, and the creeks around the area, they start out competing the native fishes. So it's a, it's a problem that people, especially the, the Ministry of the Environment, Ministry of the Fisheries there in Peru, are close, they're closed-minded about. They think there's not a problem, but in fact, there is a massive uh, problem with, with the tilapia. Now, once, a, once these, uh, or excuse me, Grammy, tilapia now is becoming a problem there. Um, so we're, we're hoping that tilapia don't take over like they have in a lot of areas. Now, once an invasive finds its way to a new environment, they tend to be free of the normal things that affect native creatures. One thing is they, um, there's no natural predators. So they tend to um, be predator free. When a, a new fish comes into an area or a new species, whether we're talking about plants or animals, um, the native species have to adapt in terms of knowing that this new species can be food. So they're free from predators. They tend to be free from diseases and parasites that affect the local flora and fauna. So these two things give them a great advantage over normal species. Um, they will outcompete native species because in this evolutionary process, an organism only knows how to compete with the other organisms in its environment. And so without, a, without that evolutionary process going on, these non-native species can become exotics. In other words, they can, these non-native species can become invasives uh, because they then will outcompete other species. Uh, for those of you who've listened to some of my talks uh, recently, talks online uh, from other fish groups, um, you know that in the Amazon, and in many locations that have this flood stage, this is when these fish are going to be reproducing. The native fishes are going to re be reproducing. About 90%, 90 to 95% of them are going to be reproducing during the flood stage. So when the river floods, it overtakes the terrestrial vegetation. Lots of food comes about. The, the plants, the leaves start decomposing, bacteria uh, form on the, the leaves. Um, other organisms eat the bacteria. So there's a very wide variety of things for those juvenile fish to eat. When dry season comes, the fish aren't reproducing. But in the case of grommies, grommies are able and are reproducing all year long. So they're able to reproduce in a time that the native fishes 
aren't reproducing. So their numbers, their population numbers tend to increase all year long. Um, whereas the native fish species, you get a pulse that occur right after the uh, rainy season where you get population numbers increase and then they start slowly decreasing as more and more individuals get picked off by predators. Well, that's not true with the grommy and many invasives. Now, you know, these, um, these non-native or these invasive species can affect the native populations in a couple different ways. Uh, one way they can do is if they're closely related to some of the native species, they can hybridize. We see that in Cambodia. I've done some work in Cambodia looking at invasive tilapia. Uh, there is a fish that's used in aquaculture, Claris catfish, the walking catfish. There is a native walking catfish in Cambodia. And when these African walking catfish escape from the aquaculture ponds, they then can hybridize with these other species, with the, the native um, Clara species. And what you do is you create a process called hybrid vigor. Uh, we see hybrid vigor in a lot of animals. The, um, the mule is a really classic example where you have an animal that has a lot of endurance. It's much stronger than the jack, which is the male um, donkey, and a horse. So that mule is a much stronger animal, much stronger pack animal than any one of those two parental species. And so we see this occurring in a lot of animals. Um, these non-native fish species or species in general can harbor new parasites, new diseases that the native organisms haven't evolved with. So they don't have the immune system to deal with it. Um, in some cases, they can modify the habitat. In the case you have in, in many of the Western states, uh, we've brought in grass carp to get rid of some of the, of the aquatic plant problems. But what happens with the grass carp is, even though that you want them to eat the hydrilla or some other non-native plants, they don't know the difference between a native and non-native. And since, so in some areas, they eat all the plants. Uh, I saw a lake once you know, here in Southern California that was overstocked with um, grass carp. And the grass carp actually would jump out of the water, leap out of the water, and eat all the grass around the lake. And so there was a ring of grass or a ring of no growth of plants all the way around that lake where the fish would actually jump out and eat those plants. So they have, ver um, they are, they're voracious eaters when it comes to plants. Uh, I'll answer the, the question from Paul. The, the um, species of grami that we find in Peru are the blue grami, or also called two-spot grami, um, very popular uh, aquarium fish. It was brought to Peru uh, in the 70s where uh, we had a, a fish farmer that was raising about 10 to 15 different species of fish to sell in the local market, in the local Peruvian aquarium trade. Uh, during the rainy season, it was a very heavy rain that year, flooded his, his ponds, but the only thing that survived after they were released uh, were the blue grommy. They, they're pre-adapted for their those uh, disturbed habitats. The the sewage open sewage canals because they have that labyrinth organ. They come to the surface; they can breathe air. So the lack of oxygen in these canals uh, did not uh, hurt them. Um, There's other things that the, um, the non-natives can do is once a non-native comes in and becomes invasive, it makes the environment uh, much more susceptible to uh, other non-natives. So non-natives can 
multiply in terms of the number if they have a chance to get in. Um, now, a lot of times the aquarium trade is being blamed for um, introduction of non-native species. That is true. In the case of Florida, uh, it's not necessarily, you know, it's not what we think of. I'm going out, I'm dumping my fish into a, a canal once I get tired of them. But, you know, we know Florida has massive amounts of uh, fish farms. Uh, during the um, hurricanes, those fish farms get flooded. And so if you go to, um, you go to Florida, you know, they have a lot of non-native fish, non-native birds, non-native reptiles, non-native plants that wreak havoc on the environment. Um, so the aquarium trade is one way, but you also have fish released for sport fishing. Um, in Peru, the first exotic fish that was brought in was brought in in 1935, and that was the lake trout, was brought into Lake Titicaca. Uh, they thought they would supplement the, um, the people's fishing there um, for they, the native people in Lake Titicaca fish for a, a small fish that's about four to five inches long, and that's what they eat. And that's what they ate. Ministry of Fisheries brought in lake trout thinking, okay, we're going to, we're going to supplement the food for these people. And also we may be able to establish a sport fishing there. Well, what the lake trout did is they went in, they went in and decimated the native fish species. They caused one fish species to go completely extinct and another one to be in low numbers. And trout, in Peru, by many of the local peoples, is thought of like we think of carp, a trash fish. It's not a fish that they want to eat. Um, so it didn't do what they really wanted it to do. Um, another way that fish species and other species are also brought in uh, is through aquaculture, tilapia in many areas here in Southern California, uh, we also have tilapia being brought in for aquaculture purposes. There's no way you're going to prevent them escaping unless it's a cement pond that has no outflow. Um, and so aquaculture does release a lot of non-native fish species. But we also have state and federal agencies who release non-native fishes. Um, here in the U.S., Gambusia, which is uh, Gambusia affinis, which is found east of the Mississippi River, have been transplanted all over the United States for mosquito control. In Peru, in many other parts of the world, they brought in guppies. Even though they're native fishes, do just as good a job eating the mosquitoes and the mosquito larvae the federal officials say, oh, here's a fish that we can make sure will eat the mosquito larvae. Well, you know, guppies, they eat anything. And in work that my, myself and my students have done is that these uh, guppies are eating fish eggs, uh, especially the killifish in the area. And so they're, they're eating some Mosquito larvae, we still have yellow fever. They still have dengue fever outbreaks in many parts of the Amazon, even though they have guppies. And so they're really not doing the job they were supposed to be doing. Um, we also see certain religious practices in, in which they release fish into the wild as an offering to uh, for someone who's sick. Um, and we, you know, there are suspected cases, some of the, the Snakehead cases that we see on the east coast of the United States have been introduced into the environment, supposedly by uh, offerings to help a sick relative. So that's basically what uh, the idea of invasives are. 
you know, the most dramatic case of invasive species that we see in the world was in um, Lake Victoria. Uh, Lake Victoria had around 400 endemic species of cichlids. They brought in, uh, for aquaculture purposes, Nile perch. Nile perch get large, get up to six, seven feet long, up to um, 500, over 500 pounds. And they brought them in as cage culture fish. So they put them in cages uh, in Lake Victoria but they couldn't control the fish from escaping. Within a few years, instead of having 400 endemic species of fish, there was only 10 species of cichlids left in that lake. So they wiped out massive numbers of, of cichlids, native cichlid species in Lake Victoria. And once those species are gone, they will never come back, except what we see now in Lake Victoria is some hybridizing occurring in some of those niches that these endemic native fishes had are being, are being occupied by some of these hybrids. And these hybrids are fertile hybrids. Uh, and so there's the fish populations are slowly coming back uh, in Lake Victoria. But that is really the extreme case in terms of, of uh, non-natives becoming invasive species. Now, when you go to Lake Victoria and catch um, Nile perch, they've, out, they've, they've pretty much taken out all the large fish and what they're left with are, are small sub-adults to small adults. And so the fisheries there became a pretty good fisheries in Lake Victoria the fishery there has collapsed. So the fish they brought to, for food purposes and for, for the people to sell the fish is starting to collapse now. So they no longer have that good fisheries anymore. So what do we do as, as aquarists? Uh, we become responsible aquarists. Uh, you know, I've seen many people uh, or I've talked to many people who I knew had aquariums that no longer have aquariums. And I asked, you know, what did you do with your fish? 90% of them said, well, I, you know, I went down to the lake, went down the pond and threw my fish in. Um, because they felt that was a better life for their fish. They thought they were being responsible. They did not feel like um, that um, they were being kind to the fish by killing the fish. No one would take the fish, so what was their better alternative? You know, flushing down the toilet could be an alternative, but the best alternative is to humanely kill your fish if you can't get rid of them. And the most humane way to get rid of your fish, if there's a humane way to kill your fish, is either with Alka-Seltzer, uh, put them in a bag, put in Alka-Seltzer, uh, the CO2 and, and carbon monoxide content increases in the water they slowly go to sleep and then they will suffocate while they're sleeping another way is to use clove oil clove oil is used as an anesthesia for fish and if you overdose them with the anesthesia they just will slowly uh, not slowly but they will die um, but it's supposedly a painless death for fish again then we get into the problem do fish really feel pain these things we really don't know. We know that the pain center in fish is very small, but does that really mean that they don't uh, feel pain? So there's been questions going up in, in chat uh, because I do not have mods right now. Sorry, we will get mods. Um, please feel free to um, put in any questions you have in chat. This is going to be a short chat today because I didn't want to overburden you guys with science the first time out. Uh, really, I want to know um, what what you guys would like to talk about in terms of uh, fish conservation. We will talk about some of the care species that are available in the hobby that we sh should all be uh, should all be 
trying to breed uh, in the hobby to give to other people um, because it's, you know, it's, it's responsible for us to try to keep a species going, uh, even though it may not be the most beautiful species. Um, also, I, I do want to, you know, look at one thing about the, the Lacey Act amendments is, you know, if a species is potentially be, can become invasive in one state, Florida, Hawaii, the two uh, congressmen who who put the the um, the the amendment in, um, if it can become invasive in those two states, which tend to have tropical environments, um, it's it's going to be blacklisted. It's not going to be put whitelisted on any, you know, on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife papers. So you can't import them. You can't transfer across state lines legally. Uh, but I, I went uh, a couple weeks ago, looked at the invasive fish in Minnesota. And Minnesota, in terms of their fish, have very few invasive fish. They have the round goby, which came in in ballast water into the Great Lakes. They have um, uh, some of the carp species, big head white carp, uh, that, was, uh, that escaped aquaculture. And really the only fish that they have from the aquarium trade is goldfish. Goldfish tend to be cold water fish anyway. Uh, and so even though they have acarus there, they have people who have aquariums, even if they are being released, they're not surviving. So it was, I think it's very short-sighted um, by this, this amendment is very short-sighted. It doesn't look at each state independently. Uh, and, and so that's, you know, the major problem I see. It's going to hurt, hurt our hobby. If we all want to have goldfish and, and guppies, then we're all going to have goldfish and guppies in our aquariums. Or there's going to be a major black market for these fish. And there's always going to be a black market. You know, the, here in California, we can't have stingrays. We can't have um, Asian um, arowanas. All of the United States can't have Asian arowanas. I can make a phone call and within five minutes, I can have both fish in my tank back there if I really wanted to. So they're around. Uh, we're all going to have to go undercover. We're all going to have to, you know, go on the dark web and start selling our fish. Um, but uh, it's very short sighted. So let me um, go. What species are gourmets refined? I've, I've said that one. That's the blue gourmet um, or the two spot gourmet. Uh, Trichopterus, Trichogaster, or Trichogaster, uh, one of them. Uh, and what species are do you find in Peru? You know, there's there's something that a lot of people don't realize about the discus in Peru. Discus are native to Peru, but only in the Putumayo River, which forms the border between uh, Peru and Ecuador. Uh, it's an area that most people don't go to because it's an area that still has a lot of uh, uh, terroristic activities and it's a major cocaine producing area. And so, you know, people don't want you to be going into the river by their cocaine fields and by their cocaine processing plant. So uh, even the, the fisheries ministry doesn't like to go there. There are some fish coming out of the Puta Mile, some discus. Uh, but very few. The discus that I have in my tank and that are most widely available out of Peru are um, a discus that originated from the Putumayo River and from Brazil. There, there were two cases in which um, we had people go into Brazil, catch thousands of discus from the... Uh, Lake Tefe region, which is used to have the most beautiful red spotted green discus. Now they've been outfished from there and there, you know, there are a few good ones left, but not many, as well as other areas in Brazil. They flew them back into Iquitos, the area where I work in. Um, they ran out of fuel and they landed in the Rio Nanai, the uh, upper regions of the Rio Nanai. And just dump their fish into the river. 
Another case was a fish farmer who had them in a, a, a series of ponds. Discus don't like pond systems whatsoever. They really uh, get attacked by uh, hexameda. They get all skinny. They get very gaunt, and they don't do very well. Well, luckily for us, or unluckily for um, you know the Peruvians, is that um, his ponds also flooded. The dikes broke. All the fish went into Rio Nanay. And so that great fisheries that we see now for the discus in the Rio Nanay and in Peru are actually invasive species. They're not invasive, they're exotics. Um, the problem is we don't know if they've displaced anything. This happened in the 70s. So what we see now is the aftermath of what's happened. Um, so it doesn't seem that they affected much in terms of the ecology. Discus in the wild, primarily, um, they're going to eat detritus. They're eating some of the clam shrimp, the seed shrimp, um, pick off uh, the film off of the, the, the tree limbs and the barks, bark of the tree, not the actual bark, but the the um, animals that live, the bacteria that live on the outside. Of them. And so they may have occupied, they may be occupying a niche that just no other animal had at the time. So they are exotic, but yet, you know, you buy a red spotted green discus from Peru, even at the exporter level. Um, on the exporter in price, some of them go as high as 75, 85 to $100. That's the exported price. You imagine what it's going to be coming into the United States or Germany. Uh, the price is going to be $200, $300 if you can find them in pet stores. Those are for the, the most beautiful. Uh, regular green discus are sold by the exporter for a large for $10, $20. So they're easily, you know, $80 fish in, in, the, uh, in the pet stores. Uh, still a beautiful fish. I, you know, I, I haven't had many problems with, I've only lost one discus since they've been in, in my tanks. I have 30 here and 20 in my fish room. I've only lost one fish since I brought them in. So they're not as hard as people think. You just have to treat them right. And one thing we see is that, um, you know, one thing that most people don't realize is discus eat a lot. They have a very small, very short digestive system. So they're going to be eating constantly, constantly. Uh, and that's one of the problems that a lot of people have is they can't keep the water clean enough or they um, they just don't feed their fish enough, enough and their fish just slowly, slowly fade away. You know, a discus, I've had a discus not eat for nine months, nine months before it died. And no matter what I did, that fish just would not eat. Um, I always thought I could save it, so that's why I never uh, euthanized it. But that's uh, that's something that um, you know that these fish can last a long time, just slowly dying without us realizing it. Uh, so if you do have questions, you know, put at Amazon Research Center for Ornamental Fishes in there, so I can see you. Um, couple questions uh, from, let's see, uh, Dwayne Kitchell. Um, is this a beautiful part of Peru? Does it, it's unspoiled. Unfortunately, not much of Peru, except maybe near the Putumayo is unspoiled. They have a lot of problems. In Iquitos, Iquitos is a city of about 750,000 people. And so people are moving from the villages in the rainforest into Iquitos now because they think there's more opportunity for them for work. There's not much opportunity for them. And so many of these people uh, will build homes on in someone's land. There, there is a homesteader law in Peru. If someone has land, um, and they're not utilizing it for anything right now. If you build a home, you that is now uh, you have right to that land. And so, even if you have a large fence around it, people can knock down the fence. And unless they have guards there 24 hours a day, people are going to invade your land. And that's what's happening 
uh, all around Iquitos and these people don't have um, proper sewage, proper water. And so it's, it's really spoiling the environment. Litter is a big problem in Peru. They they have a trash system in Peru. There is trash pickup, uh, but what you do is uh, you throw your trash on the side of the road, hopes er hope everybody else throws their trash in the same place, and that trash piles up. So every two days or so, uh, the trash truck comes by, picks up the trash, but they're not going to rake up the trash, and so they leave behind tons of plastic paper, plastic bags. And when the rain comes, that is all going into the river. Uh, and so, you know, we're trying to, to overcome that in the village that, that the research center is. We're trying to have um, more of a trash pickup system for them. Uh, but, you know, it's not something people are used to doing. So it's, it's, uh, it's an uphill battle for us, but we're trying to be good stewards not trying to be bad Americans and coming in and saying, this is what you should do because we know better. We're trying to, you know, educate the people on there is a better way. You, you know, do you want to save your environment for your future generations? And that's what they're, we're there trying to do for the people. You know, the worst thing you can do is tell them what they have to do, not give them a choice because, you know, even though I have a research center there, this is not my land per se. This this is still their country. Uh, I'd love to this place where you can see edges of the aquarium. Well, thank you very much, Didi. Um, as a, as a corner tank, it's much easier to see all parts of the tank. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Um. Question or a comment from Dwayne about the Madre de Rios, Madre Dios area. Uh, the Madre Dios area is not unspoiled. There is massive amounts of, of gold uh, mining going on, and this is not gold mining as we would think of gold mining. But they're they're taking high pressure hoses and and just spraying the the banks of the river down. Um, and if you go to Google or any of your search engines and search an engine, uh, a photo for gold mining in um, Madre del Dios area, you can see what's happening. Um, one of the things is um, they do to extract the gold is also they use mercury. The mercury re reacts with the gold and comes out of solution. Uh, but that waste mercury is going into the water. And they're, they are really poisoning not only their water, but their citizens. You know, we have bioaccumulation, which means that as you get higher, higher in your food web, the upper food web, the, the fish that eat the fish are concentrating massive amounts of mercury. And those are the fish that we eat. Uh, and they've done some hair clippings. That's how you check for mercury poisoning. And people just look at their, clip their hair and, and look at the mercury and most of the citizens in that area have high mercury levels. The animal that has the highest mercury levels are the pink dolphins. Um, they're eating all the fish and people do eat pink dolphins. You know, it's one of those things that we would you know, most of us would not think of doing. Uh, but when you're hungry, you're hungry. And those people have massive loads of, of, of um, mercury in their system. Best food for discus. Um, I feed my discus a variety of food. Um, wild discus take, a, take time to get used to some of our prepared foods. Uh, I do not use beef heart. Beef heart is a great food to make your fish grow. That extra protein adds lots of musculature to your fish. They tend to mature much earlier. That's why, you know, Captive bred discus can breed at about nine months to a year. Wild caught fish take three to four years to mature because they're not eating as high protein diet as we feed them. So I, I get mine onto uh, Tetra bits. That's a really easy fish food to feed them. It takes time again for them to get used to it. But these, these discus behind me, they, they'll, 
they'll go crazy after tetra bits. I do add flows and blood worms uh, to their diet. Um, occasionally, frozen, frozen tube effects worms. And if you really want to be nice to your fish, you give them live black worms. But the problem with live black worms, I don't worry about diseases with, with live black worms. Once they start having that taste for live black worms, it's hard to get them to eat anything else. So they get live black worms maybe once a month. I, you know, I primarily feed it for the corridors that live in there. Corridors love to, to grub around in the sand to look for those uh, uh, tube effects worms, but the discus will eat them as well. What other species do you find cohabitating with discus? Well, you find angelfish, you find festivums, you find um, severums. Um, you know, all the typical fish that you find in Peru in this area, you find cohabitating uh, with the discus. About three years ago, right before COVID hit, uh, we were doing some fish sampling in the sand area. And the sand area, the sandy beaches where you find kangaroo, uh, for those who we were talking about it earlier, um, but the sandy areas, we actually found discus. Now, there were no plants, no trees. You tend to find discus around brush piles where you find angelfish as well. But there was none of this. And we found 10 discus just there in the sandy beach area. It, it was a surprise to everybody. So and there we found, we caught catfish, we, you know, corridors, we caught uh Mouse cats, for those of you who know some of your catfish, mouse cats were caught there. Um, tetras, um, lemon tetras, um, glass tetras, all sorts of um, um, knife fish. So a variety of fish are, are found uh, with discus. Um, it used to be in the old days, they would say never put discus with angelfish. Uh, because angelfish harbor diseases that can be transferred to the discus. And besides, you're not found in the same habitats. Well, as they've been exploring more and more in Brazil, you do find angelfish cohabitating with, uh, uh, you know, found in the same areas as discus. So that old wife's tale, that old adage uh, doesn't seem to be true anymore. Um so Carol Cox, uh, do you have heavy water changes or big filtration for your discus in, and what is your pH? Well, the discus in the big tank, um, I have two large ocean clear filters. Uh, not large, they're probably three gallons that one is filled with uh, um, these balls that are used in swimming pool filters. They're probably about two inches in diameter. They're, they're these cloth balls. Um, and then the second canister goes into um, some biological filtration material. Um, these little beads, the floating beads that continually rotate as water goes through them. That, that's, that's all the filtration I have. Uh, I do water changes maybe once every two weeks you know, once every three weeks. They went while I was in Peru uh, over the holidays from, I was there at, right after Christmas until early February. This tank never had a water change. Um, it's a large enough tank. The bio load is not that high uh, while they, where they did fine. I use straight tap water. Here in California, we have liquid rock. It is uh, not the best for discus. It's not the best for discus in terms of breeding discus. Uh, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a fish hobbyist. I'm not a, I do some breeding, but that's not what I want to do. I have fish for the beauty of the fish. Even in my fish room, uh, most of the fish I have there aren't breeding. Um, and so it's, our pH here is about 8.4. I never do GH, um, KH, TDS. Um, the only thing I look at is, is uh, hardness in terms of micro siemens, which takes in consideration KH, GH, TDS. TDS, you know, maybe not the most reliable, but in terms of hardness, our water runs about 300 micro siemens. 
uh, which is liquid rock. You know, we have to clean our faucets every two months because of, of the, the scale deposits that, that appear on our, on our, our uh, faucet. So it's hard water. The fish do well. I throw in leaves. I, we have um, a few uh, in our backyard. It's kind of like a tropical forest. We have bananas. Uh, small banana, uh, ice cream bananas, about 10 plants. Um, we have loquats, so I use banana leaves. I use loquat leaves, and I also use catapa leaves that I throw in there. I just so happen to do a water change on Saturday, so the water looks pretty clean. But normally it has a, a brown tint to it, uh, which helps the discus a lot. Helps a lot of fish. Help a lot, you know, those fish that are from black water streams need... Um, those tannins in the water. So let me go down some more. Let's see if I can see them. Some of the common diseases you come across, uh, parasites, bacteria, worms. Um, you know, I, I don't have that many problems. You have to know if you get wild fish, they're going to be coming in with parasites. That that's just given wild fish are filled with parasites. It's only until their immune system is depressed by sitting in a cold tank at the exporter, not being fed properly for a month before they get shipped out, getting really cold in the exportation, going to a wholesaler's tank, and they may not take care of them the best. So I always pre-treat all my fish. They quarantine. Um, they get general cure. They get Prozzi Pro. Um, you keep the temperatures right. You know, I, I don't have ick problems. I don't, you know, I don't keep fish that tend to be ick magnets like uh, clown loaches. I found clown loaches in the past to be ick magnets. Um, but in wild fish, you know, I, I did some studies looking at uh, grommies and some of the native fishes in their, their parasites. A lot of them have gill flukes. Uh, a lot of them are going to have uh, parasitic rotifers. Uh, trichodina, which is another parasite. Those are very common parasites that you see in wild fish. You just pre-treat them, quarantine them for four or five weeks. Some people say six weeks. You know, Prozzi Pro, supposedly one treatment is good. I do two or three treatments. And also, when I bring fish in from Peru, they normally are going to be at our facility uh, for a, a few weeks to a month. And we're actually treating them there at the research center. So we're quarantining them there before we ship them. And then after they ship, I also quarantine them because um, you know, one of the, the foods that we feed because it's just available to us is tubifex worms, but we actually are treating the tubifex worms for parasites. We use Prozzi Pro on our, um, are tube effects forms as they're coming in. I, I'm not being paid by Prozzi Pro. I, I just found that to be the easiest to use. I get paid by nobody. My wife pays me, but that's it. Um, she pays me to be quiet most of the time. Um, so yes, joke, I, you know, I can't have a little fun. Um, so these are just medicines that I've found have been very useful for me as a hobbyist and for, uh, for us at the research center. Uh, ick, you know, methylene blue is a common salt. We use salt for our fish there too. Salt tends to have a calming effect on the fish. Uh, it reduces the osmotic pressure of the fish. They're, they tend to be calmer. And for some of your bacteria, the fungi, and some of your parasites that don't have the ability to osmoregulate, it will kill them too. So non-iodized table salt, kosher salt, is a really good medicine to keep on hand for your fish. So if you like the stream, hit the like button. Um, I have not, uh, Cold Water Aquatic wants to know if we, if I've read anything about uh, keeping native fish, catching the native fishes. No, but most states do have regulations about native fishes. Here in California, um, you need a fishing license to collect any fish. Um, but when you collect a fish for bait, they can't be transferred to another lake. They can't be, they can only be used within that area. Uh, and so it's actually illegal to bring in 
sport fish into your aquarium. That's here in California. I don't know about other states, but each state's going to have their own regulations. Um, and so you please check with your local uh, fish and game or Department of um, Natural Resources to check what their regulations are. You know, I don't think anybody's going to check you, go home, go to your house and check your, your tanks. Uh, but they are actually, U.S. Fish and Wildlife here in California have begun to look at people's aquariums for one particular species. Um, I have a friend in, in one of the local fish clubs who got a knock on his door from U.S. Fish and Wildlife who were looking for uh, marbled crawfish, which, you know, I, I do, I have a student right now working on marble crawfish. We have the proper permits to keep them, um, but they, they are an invasive. They are illegal to have in California now. Um, and what they were doing is they were tracking down everybody who bought crawfish off a particular seller that was selling off of eBay and off of Aquabid. And they're going to see if they still had those crawfish. And if they did, they were going to confiscate them. And so, you know, we're all thinking, oh, there's no way that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife can come look at our fish uh, with these new amendments from the Lacey Act. But, you know, if they have the manpower, they could they can do what they want to. U.S. Fish and Wildlife doesn't answer to anybody. They make their own regulations. And, you know, there's no there's no comment from from the from the citizens. If there would be, we wouldn't have uh, the ban on um or Asian arowanas because they're being produced by the billions in, in pond systems. So, so um, can we see the tank up close? Oh, I guess we can see the tank up close. After this, we'll be I'll be leaving you. We're almost at it. Oh, we're at 1130 right now, California time. Uh, so after this close up, I'm on my computer, so it's hard to see. You can see the discus. You can see red spotted green discus. There's a what they call blue discus in Peru. Um, so you can see that they're not skittish. They think I'm going to feed them. It's not what we typically, so up this one right here, if you can see, hopefully the blue comes out of that. They call that a blue discus. They're actually all green. Uh, most of them appear to be all male. Um, so even if they wanted to breed, they probably wouldn't breed. Well, you know, you never know what can happen. And so we have... Um, Rummy nose tetras. There's splash tetras in here. There's all sorts of, you know, beans down below. There's, you know, different quarries. There are a few plecos, cardinal tetras, which aren't from Peru. So that's it today. Again, if you're interested in being a mod, please email me. Uh, you can email me at amaze uh, at amazonresearchcenter.org or the email that's associated with the um, the the YouTube channel, which is uh, amazonresearchcenter at gmail.com. And lastly, I don't, I don't know if I can share. I'm, you know, this is my first time doing a stream. Lastly, um, if you go, I'll post it on our YouTube channel. Starting tomorrow, we are going to have a raffle that's going to last one month. Uh, a single ticket is $50. I know that sounds a lot. Uh, you can buy multiple tickets. The price does come down somewhat. $50 will get you a round trip ticket for two to Peru. You'll stay at the research center or we'll get you a hotel. Depends upon uh, how many dormitories are available. You'll stay at the research center for a week or a hotel close by for a week. You can either... Do a collecting trip for a week or collect a trip for two days, three days. You can work at the research center in the aquarium. The aquarium we were building will be up by June 24th or help us do research. So we'll cater the itinerary to whoever wins. So this is for two. The only stipulation is there's two stipulations. You have to use it by uh, the end of August 2023. We know people... You working class, you don't have all summer off like teachers, Eduardo and myself as a college professor um, may not be able to make it this year. Well, we don't want to have that trip go to waste for you. So we'll give you a year and a half to make the trip. Um, 
And the other stipulation was what? Oh, the uh, airline ticket is um, is limited to, to uh, having a hard time speaking to two thousand dollars. A coach ticket from U.S. is going for about, um, I believe, I once I checked a couple of days ago, seven hundred and eighty to eight hundred dollars. Um, so that you know that if you fly from the U.S., that's two people for sure. Um, so please check our, our website, our YouTube. We'll post it on there. Facebook, um, Instagram will also have it. That's only going to look for a month. Um, and you know, there'll be a limited, limited number of tickets. So your, uh, chance of winning is pretty good. Um, go to YouTube, look at the dorms, look at the research center. You can see the dorms are, are very modern. Again, I wanted to make them American modern, American convenience, because I'm an old guy. I like air conditioning. I like hot water. I like to have a dryer for my clothes so they don't get all funky smelling when you put them out to dry in the rainy season. So have a good day, everybody. Again, thank you all for showing up. Uh, I do appreciate it. Hit the like, hit the share, do whatever you got to do. I do appreciate it. Um, so. This is Dr. Anthony signing out, saying, have a good day, treat your fish right, do water changes, and your fish would love you back. So thank you all for showing up today. I do appreciate your, your likes, your dislikes, and your comments. So again, contact me if you would like to be a mod. Goodbye.